Hello, everybody, and welcome to this live presentation of the Vestibular Disorders Association video education series. My name is Kathleen Strauss, and I'm with my colleague, Danielle Tolman, who are vestibular physical therapists and volunteers with the Vestibular Disorders Association. And today we're excited to bring you a conversation about the psychological impact and solutions for those in our vestibular community. Danielle? Uh, welcome, everybody. We're so happy to have you here, as well as our guest, Dr. Emily Kostelnik. She is a clinical health psychologist and someone who lives with multiple vestibular disorders. Professionally, she has earned a PhD in clinical psychology and has specialized in training in health psychology, which focuses on the interplay between medical and psychological illness. Personally, she was diagnosed with superior canal dehiscence syndrome in 2017 and underwent an initial unsuccessful surgical repair and afterward developed BPVV. She then pursued a revision repair. Fast forward a few years to postpartum, she developed chronic vestibular migraine and 3PD. With years of professional health psychology experience as well as long personal journey to vestibular recovery, she has decided to focus all of her professional efforts on providing education to the community of individuals living with chronic vestibular issues. Thus, she has founded Rooted Behavioral Education to provide her behavioral health expertise to people around the world living with these concerns. She is currently working on multiple research projects related to mental health and vestibular disorders and is in the beginning stages of developing a virtual private practice, which should launch later this year. Thank you so much for joining us. Welcome. Thank you. It's such a pleasure to be here. Today we're going to do things um, a little differently than we've done in the past. We have Emily with a presentation. She brings a, a conversation about her expertise today, and so we'll be sharing some slides with you. Um, we encourage you, if you have questions during the conversation, to include those in the comments. We'll get to some of those during the presentation, but then we will also be looking at those to make sure we loop back at the end of our presentation to answer any questions you may have. Emily, we're thrilled that you're going to be here, and I know that there are people watching from all over the world who are eager mm -hmm. to hear what you bring to this vestibular community. I'm really looking forward to sharing. Let's All right, jump I guess right in. Mm -hmm. we can jump right in. So I know many of you have probably heard of cognitive behavioral therapy or CBT. Um, maybe it's from your physician or physical therapist, or maybe you've um, been through this treatment yourself. But let's talk about what, what CBT is. And then we're gonna talk about the cognitive model, which really underlies all of CBT and helps us understand what your, how your therapist is conceptualizing how to help you and what, what areas that we can intervene to really see some improvements. So as I mentioned, CBT is cognitive behavioral therapy. And it was developed in the 1960s by a psychiatrist named Aaron Beck. Um, and he developed it by noticing that his patients who tended to stay stuck in depression had similar patterns of negative thinking. And so that's really how this therapy was born. And it's used so widely today. It has been Tr it has tremendous research support, which I'm sure we'll talk a little bit more later. Um, but first, I'd really like to dive into the cognitive model. And I'll just say this is really what I like to teach my own patients in therapy. Um, so I'm hopeful that this will be helpful for you as an educational tool and that you'll engage um, with the workshop. And I'm happy to hear any comments or any thoughts as we go along. So this first slide is uh, depicts the cognitive model. So you can see that any situation that we might encounter leads to a series of things. It leads to thoughts, behaviors, physiological sensations, and emotions. And the reason why that there's arrows on all of those lines around those four is because it's multi-directional, meaning all of these things impact one another which can be good news and bad news. Um, the bad news being if you get stuck in one of those spots, it can, it can help create a vicious cycle. The good news being there's lots of places that we can intervene to help change this cycle. Um, and you'll see also kind of as an added note, core beliefs in the bottom plays into all situations and all of our reactions. So core beliefs are things that we typically develop by around age five, and they're largely influenced by our early childhood environment, our caregivers, 
um, major events as, as we grow older, for example, being diagnosed with a vestibular disorder. And so let me give you an example of core beliefs. Um, they tend to be our kind of deeply held beliefs about ourselves, our world, and the future. And they're, as I mentioned, they're largely um, shaped by our early childhood environment. So let me give an example. If our needs are not met as children, we might develop core beliefs that the world is a dangerous place, that our future looks grim or hopeless, um, or that we're unlovable or unworthy. So these are kind of, I would say, three common ones I tend to see in clinical practice. Um, it's a common, what we call, um, cognitive triad. So people with these core beliefs, it's kind of like wearing negative glasses. So it tends to tint the way that we view the world and it impacts again, those four things, thoughts, behaviors, physiological sensations, and emotions in any given situation that we might find ourselves in. Um, and, and people who tend to have a more negative lens of core beliefs, tend to be more prone to develop things like anxiety, depression, um, self-esteem issues, just to name a few. So just to review, this is kind of the cognitive model at large. CBT first has us intervene by looking at any situation we might find ourselves in and identify those four reactions. So the thoughts, behaviors, physiological sensations, emotions. And then core beliefs is something kind of on the side that's always playing into how we react to those things. So I'm hoping we can just jump into the next slide so we can see how do we actually intervene on this cycle. So I know I mentioned that that these four things and core beliefs all impact one another. So in CBT, we like to really think about how are we going to intervene? How can we change these things to help someone who's experiencing something like anxiety and depression to give them some relief? Um, so the areas of intervention are thoughts, behaviors, physiological sensations. We cannot directly intervene on emotions because it's thought to be a byproduct of the other three. And then lastly, we can intervene on core beliefs. That tends to happen, I would say, that requires a strong therapeutic relationship. Maybe it's something that might happen later in therapy because it really can be a vulnerable thing to talk about sort of the core of your being. And it also requires some level of skill with some of the other um, practices of CBT, like cognitive restructuring, for example, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, and I know I'm throwing a lot of terms at you all, and this is probably new for many of you. So if you have any questions as we go, please, please feel free to drop them in the chat. Um, so let's move on to the next slide. So let's talk about physiological sensations first. Physiological sensations are the way that we feel in our bodies. So, for example, say I'm having um, a vestibular exacerbation of symptoms. Um, physiological sensations might be that heart racing or the dizziness. It's really how we feel in our bodies. So I want to open it up now to, to all of you to engage with this workshop. So I'm going to throw out a situation. I, I teased it a little bit right now, um, but I think this is all, this is something that we can all relate to. So I want you to think about a symptom exacerbation. So maybe you're waking up one day and you're feeling a little bit more dizzy than usual, or you just generally are not feeling your best, or maybe you notice a new symptom. So, I want you to drop in the chat, put yourself in that situation, and I want you to think about what physiological sensations might you be noticing in this situation. Um, and maybe Kathleen or Danielle, you can call it out so we can kind of open a discussion and see what other people might identify as feeling in the situation. Yeah, absolutely. You guys, I'll leave your comments in the chat so that we or in the comments so that we can uh, take a look at what you might be experiencing, imagining this, and what kind of uh, reaction you might have in those situations. Um, I know I, I haven't personally suffered from any vestibular dysfunction, but I hear a lot from patients. Uh, brain fog and fatigue, uh, Guy Ritchie had, had mentioned, and Helen White had commented with anxiety. Mm -hmm. A lot of things I've heard from a lot of patients. 
heart racing and he and chest, you know, pressure. Uh, sure, I think that's part of the, the, that's the physiological manifestation of that anxiety would be, you know, mm -hmm. the feeling in their chest. Sometimes mm -hmm. they palpitations and a, a stomach right. getting tight, panic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm so I'm hearing, I'm hearing some physiological sensation words. I'm also hearing some emotion words. Yes, I hear so that. things like anxiety and panic that we would actually categorize that more under emotions. Um, so physiological sensations tend to be strictly like that, mm -hmm. but those bodily sensations. Mm -hmm. And that's not to say that anxiety can't have like a physiological component because it surely does. Um, but just language tends to be an important topic here as well. Um, yeah. so if we're just thinking strictly physiological sensations, you, you all mentioned some, some really big ones. Any other ones in the chat? We've also got some stiff neck pressure okay. in the head, fatigue, stomach, uh, tightness, uh, heart racing, so shortness of breath, palpitations, brain fog. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And these are oh. ones that I definitely, I, I personally identify with as a vestibular patient as well. And I think they're common to many of us. I think you bring up a good point because in the clinic, we do often have to direct people to their body rather than to their worry or anticipation of mm -hmm. the onset of the vertigo. And for those who feel vertigo that comes episodically, maybe with movement or certain activities, they do have that anticipatory anxiety, but we try to direct them back to their body like you're doing. And you see it's so common to just jump right to, I'm worried, I'm afraid, I'm anxious. But you're saying, where do you feel that in your body? That's exactly. that's a whole session right there. Sometimes, <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, and anxiety really does have kind of that cognitive component, component, and that physiological component. And I think some people will identify more with one or the other, or, or some people might say they feel both very strongly. Um, but to kind of break those apart can be really helpful because mm -hmm. we target those in different ways. If that makes sense. Yeah. So people have added even the visual impairments that they feel with their uh, vestibular disorder. So mm -hmm. even a fullness or pressure in the ears. So there's ear symptoms, mm -hmm. eye symptoms, tension, muscle spasm. I mean, you know, when you talk about using your work to help the vestibular patient, this is a sort of unique population. There are so many different bodily sensations they can feel. This mm -hmm. isn't a backache. Exactly, yeah. exactly, exactly. Um, okay, so I think we got some we're some really good audience participation here. Um, so let's talk about with CBT, how do we actually intervene on this? Mm -hmm. And I think one important thing to mention here is a lot of this is re related to the autonomic nervous system. And that really kind of the main two branches are sympathetic and parasympathetic. And so when we're talking about sympathetic arousal, that's kind of the get up and go, fight or flight. It's really what's engaged with vestibular symptoms, but also with anxiety. And then the parasympathetic system helps us rest, digest, regenerate. And so a lot of times, those of us with vestibular disorders, me included, we live in kind of a chronic state of sympathetic overdrive. And it becomes this vicious cycle between the vestibular symptoms and anxiety. Um, and it becomes really the dizzy, anxious, dizzy cycle. And I have a mini course that talks directly towards this and talks about how to intervene on this anxiety during vestibular exacerbations. Um, so the intervening on physiological sensation really comes down to trying to ramp up the parasympathetic system. And so it's really targeting things like diaphragmatic breathing, which I know breathing techniques seem like, oh, that's something simple, but it really does have good research support and it can really be a good hack for the nervous system. Um, other things like progressive muscle relaxation, various body scan meditations, mindfulness techniques, um, guided imagery. So that's what I would focus on in therapy typically first i find it has a good kind of bang for your buck because people can really start to see some results quickly with that so let's move on to the next slide next we're going to talk about behaviors so i will throw it back to you all so remember the situation we're talking about here is an exacerbation of vestibular symptoms or maybe you're noticing a new symptom pop up 
So think about behaviors. This might include things that you do during this time or things that you don't do during this time. Um, so let me know what you think. What are some behaviors you can identify that might change when you are in an, uh, an exacerbation of symptoms? I'll just give that a minute for people to comment and look sure. in the comment section. I love what you said about the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. People, uh, a lot of our talks are mentioning this and, um, you know, years ago, I don't think patients were aware of, of these words and these types of autonomic systems going on in our body. But mm -hmm. to think that again, the parasympathetic nervous system being rest and, and elaborate on that. And then autonomic, I mean, and, and then the sympathetic nervous system being the opposite of that. Mm -hmm. Can you repeat those while people are thinking sure, about sure. that? Sure, sure, sure. Um, so the autonomic nervous system has kind of two major branches, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. And the sympathetic is really fight or flight. So it has really an evolutionary like, an evolutionary purpose to that because we want to be able to protect ourselves ourselves when we're, we find ourselves in danger. The problem is that it can start to misfire when we're perceiving danger when there isn't danger. And so I think it's kind of a normal response to perceive that dizziness or that vertigo attack as danger because it's very unsettling. It might startle us. But the problem is that when we go on to develop chronic vestibular symptoms, we're we're in a state of chronically perceiving danger when really there isn't danger. And so it really ramps up that system and engages things like heart rate, sweating, nausea, temperature control. Um, even the vestibular symptoms themselves are, can be caused by sympathetic arousal. Um, so that's kind of the sympathetic side of the branch. Mm -hmm. And then the parasympathetic side is really the rest, digest, regenerate. So that is, is in charge of calming us down. It's largely related to the vagus nerve, which is one of the longest cranial nerves that goes from our brainstem to all of our bodily organs. Um, and so if our, we don't have good, what's called vagal tone, which we can, we can improve by practicing these types of exercise I mentioned, um, our bodies tends to kind of favor the sympathetic side rather than coming into balance. So you're saying that people have power to modulate their nervous system. And exactly. that's really the goal exactly. here. So let's look at what people are saying. They're saying that a lot of isolation resting, mm -hmm. snapping, avoidance behaviors, mm -hmm. ignoring it. Some catastrophize, automatically think the worst, napping, uh, mm -hmm. increased pacing, mm -hmm. um, rapidly exit, sort of that's a flight, like a flight. Exactly, that is a major flight. Uh, some keep trying, that's good, perseverance. Stay home, avoidance, you know, um, mm -hmm. isolation, avoidance, moodier, so it affects our mood. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Avoiding crowds and avoiding triggers, uh, even so much to avoid social uh, situations and ha develop um, mm -hmm. some agoraphobia, paranoia, mm -hmm. uh, self-isolation, canceling mm -hmm. plans, uh, staying in bed. So I have to I have to say that this audience, this is a very well informed audience mm -hmm. and you're using even some of the clinical terms that I would use. Um, so that that I do like to see that I do like to see well informed people who are really proactive about taking care of themselves. One thing I heard a lot you mentioned was avoidance. And that really is a major clinical target for vestibular disorders and not coincidentally also anxiety. Yeah. Um, and so avoidance behaviors are things like not going to work, not going to social events, not going out for a walk, or not engaging in things that are important to us for fear of what might happen. And there typically tends to be an overestimation of how bad that outcome might be. But the problem with avoidance is that our worlds become smaller and smaller and smaller. And this is compounded by our vestibular systems becoming more and more deconditioned. And so the same way that your muscles decrease in size, if you're not exercising, your vestibular system becomes less effective and efficient as you're not engaging with it. Um, and then for the anxiety side of it, there's something called negative reinforcement, which is avoiding something bad. 
So in our heads, we're saying, oh my gosh, if I were to go out on a walk right now, I'm going to have a vertigo attack and it would be terrible. And there's all this language and cognitive distortions probably going on in our heads. And so we assume, well, because I stayed home, nothing bad happened. So because of that reinforcement, we're more likely to continue doing that in the future. And it just becomes, again, the same vicious cycle of making our world smaller and smaller. The vestibular system becomes more deconditioned and our anxiety is reinforced. I think that will be a cognitive distortion. Sorry, Danielle, you said there's a cognitive distortion going on. Are you uh, thinking that our audience could identify what those are? Or do you identify a cognitive distortion when you hear their story and their behavior? Um, I, I, we're going to get to cognitive distortions okay. when we talk about thoughts. Sorry. <laughs> so let's just, wait till that part. I was just going to mention that that vicious cycle is exactly why vestibular therapy might seem so counterintuitive to patients. You know, you tell them that we want to get them to start moving in order to get them to start feeling better. And they look at you like you're crazy because you're like, wait, that's the one thing that makes me dizzy. Mm -hmm. um, but in reality, you know, getting into that and getting into movement to avoid that decompensation is so important. And I think which is why cognitive behavioral therapy goes so well hand in hand with vestibular therapy, especially for diagnoses like 3PD. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. And I, I would say that's been my personal experience, too, as a patient kind of going into VRT, like you want to intentionally make me dizzy, you know, like I've been avoiding these movements. Um, but just for those of you who haven't tried VRT from my personal experience, it feels like a really safe space to engage with that and to experience that dizziness. And it can really give you confidence moving forward. Like, okay, if I have a symptom flare or something, I, I can handle it because I've felt this before in a safe space with my, with my physical therapist. Um, so, so we, in, we, we talked about intervening or we talked about avoidance as a clinical target. So what would we do to actually intervene on this cycle? So we like to do something called behavior activation. And I like to do this kind of second in the process. So after physiological sensations, I like to talk about intervening on behaviors, which is things like planning and en enjoyable activities. It's things like planning activities over which you feel mastery, meaning things that make you feel productive or things that um, make you feel like, achieve, like you're achieving something. Mm -hmm. Because research shows that people who are happier and healthier tend to live a life full of something called positive contingencies, meaning you get positive reinforcement for things that you do. So in other words, you're doing things that make you feel good. Um, and and the, the two big clinical targets in CBT are that, that pleasure piece and the mastery piece. Um, and beyond those two things, research shows that exercise is hugely important for mental and vestibular health. We know it can help mitigate symptoms of anxiety and depression. It can help decrease inflammation. It can help promote neurogenesis, which is the creation of new neurons, which is really important for neuroplasticity, um, which I know is kind of a, a topic that a lot of people in this field talk about. So did you two have anything to add on the behavior front? Oh, I think we're good to keep going. All right, so let's hop on to thoughts. So this is probably what you think of the most when you think about CBT, because it is really a major clinical target. Um, and it's our, our way of intervening on this is called cognitive restructuring. So before we dive into that, let's revisit our situation, our sample situation where you feel an increase in symptoms or you notice a new symptom come up. So what are some thoughts that might be going through your head? We've seen a little bit of this pop up in the chat. So everyone, make sure you comment um, if you had something that commented before about what kind of comes up in this situation. And if you're having difficulty with this, um, you're not alone. It can be it can be difficult to actually think about what we're thinking. Um, so one exercise I like to do in, in clinical practice is if you're having difficulty thinking about thoughts that you might have separate yourself a little bit from it. So think if, say, you had a friend with a vestibular disorder, what what might that person be thinking in this situation? So your friend calls you and says, I'm having a major symptom flare. What thoughts might that person be thinking? I know I've had a lot of patients uh, get worried that they think, is this going to be like this the rest of my life? Am I going to mm -hmm. have to deal with this 
day every day after day, or will this ever go away? Will this be my new normal? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, some people may feel despair. Um, Deanna is very grateful for support from family and friends, which is good. It's mm-hmm. nice to get that positive response. That is, <laughs> that is a very good response. Um, and it is good to come back to gratitude in moments of difficulty for sure. We have a, uh, will it get worse? Will it stop this time? Um, Kathy has increased fear. There's frustration and worry. Um, there's a worry about I'm going to fall or everybody's looking at me. Um, I can't do what I used to do. I can't do what everyone else is doing. Uh, mm-hmm. What triggered my symptoms this time? Is this my life? Mm-hmm. A lot here. Yeah. And I think these are, these are very com very common within the vestibular community. And I personally can identify with a lot of these thoughts. Um, so, so let's talk about what we might actually do with CBT in terms of intervening on these thoughts. So you can go to the next slide. So CBT has a whole list of cognitive distortions, also called automatic negative thoughts that we like to talk about. Um, because the first step in being able to intervene or manage these is being able to identify them. And typically people will engage in similar thinking patterns. So they might engage in the same few cognitive cognitive distortions over and over and over again. Um, and there is this is by no means an exhaustive list. I go much more in depth on this in, in my comprehensive course that talks about CBT and also acceptance and commitment therapy. But two of the most common ones I see are number one, catastrophizing, and number two, fortune telling. And so let's talk about what those are. Catastrophizing is assuming the worst possible outcome. So for example, with the way things are going, I'm gonna be disabled, or with the way things are going, I'm not gonna be able to work anymore. So it's kind of imagining really a worst possible scenario in your head. Moving on to fortune telling. This is predicting what's gonna happen in the future with little to no evidence. So I woke up feeling dizzy. Therefore, I'm going to feel dizzy all day. I'm going to feel dizzy all week. This is going to this is going to be a symptom flare that's going to last for months and months. Um, so as I mentioned, the first step in working with these cognitive distortions is being able to recognize them, and then we can really ask ourselves certain questions to work with these thoughts. One of those being, what is the evidence for this? And and that can really help us to sort of dismantle this and to see maybe I'm attaching too much to these thoughts or maybe I'm putting too much weight on these thoughts when really I I can't say that these things are true. Maybe these are just, just thoughts that my kind of anxiety brain is telling me, but they're not necessarily based in reality. Or do these thoughts have a purpose for me? You know, is it is it serving me well to have these thoughts? And typically the answer to that is no. Um, and then we can come up with more realistic ways of thinking about this. And then we practice this repetitively. So if I were to see someone in therapy, for example, they might have worksheets of identifying situations and identifying these four things we're talking about, this one being thoughts. And, and really digging into those thoughts. So identifying what distortions am I engaging in? And this is a collaborative process that I would help with, obviously. And then we really practice this repetitively with the goal being to engage neuroplasticity. Because a lot of us have engaged in this type of thinking for years and years and years. And so when we're trying to change that cycle, it requires a lot of effort and time and and repetition, as I mentioned. So I think we can go forward. The last place to intervene, as I mentioned, I talked a a little bit about this before, is core beliefs. Um, And as stated previously, this really requires digging down into the core of your being. It's those deep-seated beliefs you have about yourself, the world, and your future. And it it typically requires a pretty strong therapeutic relationship and happens over a course of, I would say, typically months. So if you want to go to the next... Okay. So this is just a review. So any situation you might find yourself in leads to a host of different reactions, thoughts, behaviors, physiological sensations, emotions. And and again, the core beliefs are always kind of in the background and think of them as like the colored lenses that you wear that 
that influences the way that you view the world. And the place that we can intervene on this cycle are thoughts, behaviors, physiological sensations, and then later, typically later in therapy would be core beliefs. So again, I know this is a lot to digest. It's a lot of sort of jargon to take in, but I hope that you've been able to identify with this example. And um, I look forward to our further discussion on this and I'm happy to answer any questions about this. I think, uh, well, oops, sorry, can we go right ahead. <laughs> well, this, this was a wonderful and definitely the tip of a much larger iceberg, but I, I feel like our audience can really relate to the fact that mindset, how we're thinking, how mm -hmm. our thoughts and beliefs impact the way our body feels. And this, you know, is this, this mind body connection is really being acknowledged. And um, do you work with a patient when they are in vestibular physical therapy? Do you think that this work should be done first? Or uh, what, how would that work if someone is receiving vestibular rehabilitation, um, you know, would you do that working with the practitioner or separate? That's, that's a really good question. Um, there's actually one study that comes to mind that showed that CBT helped augment the improvement seen in VRT. So what, what that means is when patients are in vestibular rehab therapy, they tend to actually see more gains when they're also working in CBT. And so I think I think that that provides obviously some promising evidence and in favor of CBT, but I think it's also important to note that we have to meet patients where they are. And I think both of these therapies require a lot of time and effort. Um, and it's, you know, seeing therapists for maybe an hour a week or more, but it's also doing a lot of exercises on the outside yourself, because that's really where a lot of the improvement in the work takes place. So I think it's talking to patients about their lifestyle and really what's feasible for them. Um, I think with, when you get a vestibular disorder, it's very overwhelming and you feel like you have to, you know, do all of these things at once. I have to do VRT and CBT and I have to change my diet and I, all of these things. And so it can really feel like a lot. Um, so I would say that's kind of twofold. Yes, CBT can really help augment VRT. However, I think it's also important to keep each individual patient in mind and sort of move at a pace that's reasonable for them. I, th I think a lot of vestibular therapists think and do and acknowledge the things that you're talking about. But when mm -hmm. we, we do sometimes get into a bind where a patient needs more help, then we can give them. And then mm -hmm. I can really see where one-on-one -on -one attention to just this work could help prepare a person for tolerating vestibular rehab therapy when they have that um, anticipatory anxiety is what I say, and an mm -hmm. embodied response to even be able to do some of the things we're asking them to do. So mm -hmm. it's really, I can see that benefit. And there is more research about, about it saying how positive this work will um will impact patients and allow them to get mm -hmm. more recovery in their exercises at home. Danielle, sorry about that. No, I was just going to say that it sounds like CBT is very much similar to vestibular therapy in that mm -hmm. it takes consistency and it takes practice and it takes patience. Um, mm -hmm. This isn't something that just happens overnight once you get into your first therapy session. This is mm -hmm. something that's going to take time and working with somebody who understands what you're going through and one thing that I really, truly love about your background is that you have been through the gamut. You have been in your patient's uh, seat before and you know exactly what they might be feeling or can relate to what they're feeling and going through, which I think is great. There's one mention in the comments that um, is actually something that I wanted to bring up as well because it's kind of a slippery slope when it comes to our vestibular patients. And this is um, reading forums online. Hmm. You know, sometimes we feel like uh, our patients might want to go there because they want to relate and find support. But mm -hmm. at the same time, they also find the slippery slope of going down the negative rabbit hole. So mm -hmm. what are your recommendations for those when it comes to online forums? <laughs> It, it's it's an interesting question and one that I that definitely hits very close to home for me. Um, I can say that when I was first diagnosed with SCDS, I went straight to the forums, and I I personally found that the forums were really helpful for me 
to get more inform information. So when I say information, I mean like what doctors are people seeing, what doctors are people recommending. Um, some some groups are pretty great about providing like research articles and more kind of academic information, which I really appreciated. When it came to combing through the comments and that type of thing, I personally found that to be detrimental to my mental health. I found that it, it made me very anxious and it made me compare myself to people. So I think they're kind of the people that that can interpret reading the groups as helpful in that like, I'm not alone. It's so helpful to know that I'm not alone or people like me who tend towards anxiety, which I know a lot of us are that way tend to read into each comment and think, oh my gosh, this is going to be my future. This person's having a time, a hard time. That means I'm going to have a hard time too. Mm -hmm. And this is actually a topic that has come up a lot um, on my social media. We've had pretty interesting conversations about, about that on Instagram. If you want to follow me on Rooted Behavioral Education on Instagram. A and some things I like to educate people about as well are that you really don't know everyone's backgrounds in these groups. So you don't know if they have comorbid other medical conditions. So there could be a whole host of other things going on that maybe don't apply to you. Kathleen, did you want to jump in on that one? No, that's it's very good advice, the comorbid things. I, I thought you were even going to say the education training experience and whatever about their comments, but but the comorbid things of what else is going on medically with them. So if they give mm -hmm. you a solution, a supplement, a food, a behavior, a thought, whatever it is, you you don't know. I you don't know that you oh sorry Danielle oh I was just I was just gonna jump in and say that it's also worth looking at where the forums are located mm -hmm. and who's moderating them yeah mm -hmm. right so not all forums or support groups are going to be created equally um you want to make sure you're looking at you know who's moderating this what their background is are they making sure that there's guidelines and rules to be followed are the people who mm -hmm. are commenting following them and are the moderators taking care of that um, getting in a good quality support group is important uh, you know here at Vito, we have david morrill leading his uh support group on social media which is just absolutely phenomenal and a safe place for a lot of people but like you had mentioned there's gonna be different forums for other people as well you appreciated the more academic approach and there mm -hmm. are some people who are looking more for the social support approach. Mm -hmm. um, so finding the right one is really important for mm -hmm. each individual person. Mm -hmm. And I think another important another important thing to mention is that there can be a selection bias in these groups. Um, so I find that the people who are more active in groups tend to be maybe at, towards the beginning of their journeys. Um, and so when you're seeing people co comment on things like, oh my gosh, I'm struggling, or I, I haven't seen improvement, or whatever it might be, you have to keep in mind too that people who are towards the maybe latter part of recovery or who have made a lot of progress tend not to be in the groups. Yeah. Right. And so I think it gives us a really skewed perspective of what it's like to live with a vestibular disorder. So, so, I mean, I can relate to this personally too. I was very active in the groups in the beginning, like when I was trying to find a surgeon and trying to sift through all of this information. Now that I feel like my symptoms have really stabilized and I have a great quality of life, I tend not to participate in the groups. And it's not anything negative towards those people. It's just like, I'm doing other things at this point. And I think that many people can get there as well, but it's just hard when you're, you don't have that, those positive stories all the time, because it's important to maintain hope. And then so one other, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, oh, I was just gonna say one other thing to keep in mind too, it, and I think Danielle touched on this um, a little bit of like where the group is located. So there's a lot, there's a big international community and healthcare systems within different countries are very different. Right. Um, healthcare around, around even just within the US is very different. People have varying levels of access to care. You know, some people might live in a rural, a rural place, and maybe they have difficulty locating a provider. Um, so, or an urban place, and they have many providers. So, it's just it's hard to really um, know if what you're reading is. I know a lot of us try to kind of think about how that's going to relate to us personally, but there are just so many factors that you can't navigate all of them. Um, so for me personally, like I mentioned, I use them to get information. And then I reached out with private message to a few people like who were having surgery around the same time that I was with the same surgeon that I was. 
and connected that way. So had kind of a more personal engagement rather than just reading comments. And that really helped me as well. And really a few of those people have become some of my best friends today. So they're definitely That's pros good. and cons, but you have to definitely kind of go in with certain expectations. That's really good advice. We do have a very large international community. And in fact, in one of the comments is, is there anything to help us in the UK? But we're really talking about a mindset and a mind mm -hmm. control and power over symptoms and improving quality of life with our thoughts that, mm -hmm. that can impact the way our body feel feels. So is there, uh, tell us about your program, sure. your practice, and then how others might find someone who can help them really uh, appreciate the value of the potentials of our mind and the potentials mm -hmm. of our thoughts on our, on our, uh, feelings on our symptoms because you know they are everyone's looking for a specialist a surgeon a, a, pe a pill whatever <laughs> but you but convincing this audience that um that there's a potential for them to improve right non-medical non-diagnostic non-surgical mm -hmm. approaches so so let me give you one example that I, I find found really powerful when I came across it I know a lot of times we like to think of like mindset as sort of a separate thing than physical things and the bottom line is they really are one and the same. Um, our thoughts actually influence our cortisol levels in our body, which influences our immune system. And so the mind-body connection is very real. If we're talking about something immune, immune modulated, um, for example, I know there's evidence that vestibular migraine has an inflammatory component. So if we're kind of thinking downstream, our thoughts are impacting the immune system, which impacts inflammation. It truly is as important as everything else that you're doing. Um, I know that might be difficult to hear for some people and it, it might feel like, oh my gosh, well, how am I going to get these resources? And that's really why I've created the courses that I did. So I have a comprehensive course called Committing to Balance, where I, I really try to touch on the major behavioral health topics that are relevant to vestibular disorders. And they, it's 10 modules. And the way that the modules are structured is there's a didactic portion. So I talk about, you know, why am I more likely to experience anxiety with a vestibular disorder? Or why do I have brain fog? Or why am I isolating or avoiding things? And then I give actionable steps of things you can actually do at home to, again, intervene on this cycle. And so I, I cover targets like balancing your nervous system. So we talked about that parasympathetic activation. I talk about CBT much more in depth than I did today. And I give um, steps you can do at home to intervene on the cycle yourself. I talk about acceptance and commitment therapy, which I absolutely love. It's a mindfulness-based therapy that has some similarities to CBT and some differences. Um, neuroplasticity, cognitive health, social support, sleep hygiene. And I give some resources for how to find other providers that you might want to see. And then I have a mini course also called Breaking the Dizzy Anxious Dizzy Cycle, which I would say is CBT informed. It goes over some relaxation techniques and some sort of mindset techniques that you can use in vestibular exacerbations. And my, my goal with these is really to be able to serve the worldwide community because I have people message me all the time saying, can I see you for therapy? Or can you send me to someone to see for therapy who knows about vestibular disorders? And I wish I had a list to give people, but the bottom line is that I don't. And that's really what I'm trying to change with sort of advocacy and building awareness. Um, and the courses I think are a really good way to get started with that. And I've even had people take the information they've learned in the courses to their therapist so they can work on those things and kind of help process through those things together. Um, I'm in the process, the beginning stages of starting a virtual private practice that I'm hoping is gonna launch this summer. Um, I'm a military spouse, so there's always things that can come up and we're supposed to be making a cross country move here in the near future. Um, so that's something to look out for. In terms of people in the US, I pulled up a few websites. Um, so there are various professional organizations that providers might have listings in. So one of those is the Academy of Cognitive Therapy. That's academyofct.org. And they have like a locate a therapist option. 
Of course, there's the VITA site, um, Association for Behavioral and Cognitive Therapy, that's findcbt.org. And then beyond that, you might look on insurance panels, if that's something that's important to you. The way that mental health providers um, work in the U.S. is that our licenses are state-specific, so we can practice within the state that we're located. So you might look at local providers. And with telehealth becoming more widespread with COVID, don't limit yourself to just your very local area. You know, you might find the best fit for you that's someone who's located across the state. So if you're looking for a CBT provider, you might ask for their theoretical orientation. That's sort of the lingo that we use to, de to describe how we conceptualize patient issues and how we might work with people. Um, but beyond the theoretical orientation, and if someone has a strong foundation in CBT, the therapeutic relationship is also very important and can really account for a lot of patient change. So I hope that's helpful. I, I wish I had, you know, things to tell people around, around the world, but like our healthcare systems are so different and finding someone who's well-versed in CBT, but then also vestibular disorders is like a, a lot to navigate. Um, so I've been trying to come up with a referral list because I get messages like this all the time. So if you're watching this and you know of a vestibular, someone who's very well-versed in vestibular disorders and has a strong CBT background as well, I would love to be able to include that person on my referral list. If you want to DM me on Instagram or on Facebook, or you can email me at info at rootedbehavioraleducation.com. So I have some of that information for people to be able to contact you. So I'm putting that up there, your, your okay. um, email info at rootedbehavioraleducation.com. And um, they can find you on Instagram and right Ro at Rooted Behavioral Education. Correct. And Facebook at the same name. At Facebook, Rooted Behavioral Education. Good. And then on your dot com. It can, so, so people can take your program it's a virtual program and they mm -hmm. find that on your website is that right the 10 Correct. modules so, mm -hmm. so if you go to my website and there's like a little tab that says courses if you click on that you can look through the two courses and i kind of outline what's in each of them one imp important note is that the comprehensive course has a forum where students can engage with me directly. So like on each video or audio, you can actually ask questions specifically on those and, and I can respond to them and other students can see them. So that's kind of a helpful thing to help you along with the course because it's, it can be a lot to take in, you know, 10 modules. And then on the mini course, that's more of a standalone, um, th those are more standalone exercises that you might just do at home. So anyone in the world has access to you through your virtual courses that you've created exactly. and that you offer online. That's a wonderful thing. And so mm -hmm. um, I, I do think that technology is very, very useful for people to be able to get your expertise. And hopefully more and more therapists will, um, if, if any of them are watching, more therapists will join. We Vita has a professional directory. Mm -hmm. So we also welcome any of those professionals with expertise in your area to join as professional members because Vestibular Disorders Association would love to be able to direct our audience to uh, qualified practitioners who have a passion for this community. So mm -hmm. this has been excellent. Anything else that we need to cover before? Um, I'm glad that people can reach you and that I wish you success with your course. I think it's greatly needed as a, a, a reference for those vestibular therapists out there, for caregivers and for those who are continuing to look at how to manage this disease and, um, the impact it has on their quality of life. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, absolutely. Um, and I'm really happy to connect with any of you if you have further questions. I'm always open to answering messages or emails. I'm pretty good about responding um, in a prompt manner. So I'd be happy. I'd be happy to connect with all of you. Well, people are eager, eager to hear your superior canal to his syndrome surgery story. <laughs> so maybe that's somewhere in your library of videos. Uh -huh. and, um, a, I a actually, whole nother, that's a whole funny. Nother. I, I actually, the, a, a few weeks ago, people were interested in actually seeing my CT scan where you can see the dehiscence. Yeah. Um, I, I didn't want to share anything too gory. I actually have a picture of the dehiscence itself, but we'll, we'll save that for people who might be extra interested in the blood and 
gore. <laughs> well, some of us probably would love to see that. Yeah. So I think we'll invite you back to talk about, <laughs> about that experience and show the slides and the surgery and everything. Um, for those of you who don't know, go to Vita, vestibular.org to learn more about superior canal dehiscence syndrome, about cognitive behavioral therapy. Find Emily, who is a pro member at Vita and listed in our directory, right? Emily. Mm -hmm. yep. um, mm -hmm. And so you can reach her and find her. This has been wonderful for me. That's, that's all I have. Anything else? I think that's it. Thank you so much for having me. It's been such a pleasure. Well, thank you for providing us with such a great informational topic and um, putting on this workshop for us here at Vita to give our audience and our, our viewers uh, a lot more knowledge and insight into things that might be able to help them and work through. So we really, really greatly appreciate that. And we loved having you on. We'd love to have you back again sometime soon. I look forward to it. Continue the conversation in the comments on Facebook and YouTube. And of course, as always, uh, we at Vita appreciate your ongoing uh, connection with us and your ongoing support. Thank you all and have a healthy and happy day. Take care. Go to vestibular.org for more videos like this one. Also there, you'll find information, support, and encouragement to help you find your journey back to balance.